We just wanted to welcome you to this discussion. I'm Sarah Kalbis. I'm a sophomore here. I study sociology and global studies with a focus in the Middle East. And, um, and I'll be the, the second student ambassador. Welcome to both of you. Good evening. My name is Karaya Giles. I'm a social work and uh, Spanish major, focusing on the Latin American. Thank you um, very we much. To, oh, we just want to thank you so much for um, sitting with us to, to discuss um, democracy and peace in an interdependent world. And so we're excited to have a discussion and ask some questions. Well, we are delighted to be with you at uh, Pittsburgh. And uh, we hope the weather is as good in Pittsburgh as it is in New York today. Because we are out of the frozen weather which converted all of us into ice cream and are now coming back into normal behavior. But it's an even greater pleasure to have as our distinguished panelist, Mr. Laurenti. Mr. Laurenti is the director of the Century Foundation, a very important NGO, and in fact, a very important think tank. And in fact, more than that, Mr. Laurenti is the brains behind the think tank, because he puts out a, uh, a, an email twice a month in which uh, the, an idea is picked up and enunciated by him. And this, uh, this email system that he runs is widely read by uh, decision makers, particularly in Washington uh, and certainly in New York. So it's a pleasure, sir to have you here at this table. I'd delight to be with you, Ambassador Kamal. <clears throat> now, the subject that you have put out in front of us, democracy and peace, is a subject which you will forgive me, I do not understand. I do not understand because I don't see what is the link between democracy and peace. These are a bunch of Western countries who have been stating ad nauseum and ad infinitum that democracies do not go to war. And you know and I know that it is utter nonsense. Look at all the wars that we've had in the recent past. All of them have involved the quote-unquote so-called democracies. In fact, they have involved the greatest democracy in the world, namely the United States. So how can we say that democracies do not go to war? Democracies do go to war, and they go to war, in fact, even more than dictatorships. And so it is better to be a dictator than to be a demo democracy if you want peace, because dictators are in favor of the status quo. All dictators love the status quo. And so status quo means peace. Now, you may not like it because you may say, the status quo is against human rights. Well, you've got to pay a price. Either you want peace, in which case you've got to get human rights violations, or you want change, in which case you've got to have wars, and wars kill people. If you make the statistics about the number of innocent civilians killed in the past 20 years, or the past 50 years, you will find that this country on whose soil we stand has pride of place as the number one killer of innocent civilians. Starting from Hiroshima and Nagasaki into more than a million people in Iraq and then in other wars. And so what are we talking about? Why are you so fascinated by this concept of democracy and peace? And why are you trying to sell it to me, who comes from a country of origin, which does not believe in democracy? We, we have a dictatorship in Pakistan, and we are quite happy with it, because we have a crooked dictator, but at least it's peaceful. And so, why? What is the link between democracy and peace? And that is the question that I would like to throw at Mr. Laurenti. Why are you trying to hoodwink these students in Pittsburgh by making them think that democracy is important for peace. I would uh, first want to express my appreciation 
to those of you at the University of Pittsburgh who have come out this afternoon to uh, engage in this discussion. Uh, how many of you are freshmen or sophomores? Okay, most of you. All right. How many of you see any logic in the argument you have just heard from Ambassador Kamal? Put up all your hands. If you find any logic in that. <laughs> oh, well, more than I would have expected. I would have thought that even an incoming freshman would have seen this as a collection of and a claptrap of third world rubbish that's been stitched together simply to create a polemic uh, against, the, uh, against uh, the West. Now, do I agree with the proposition, the straw man, let us say, that Ambassador Kamal has set up that democracies do not go to war? No. Even those whom Ambassador Kamal is somewhat misrepresenting are careful to say democracies do not go to war with each other. And even that, as Ambassador Kamal says, uh, in some cases has been demonstrated to be an exaggeration. But it is true that in democratic societies, there are more checks on a headstrong political class in the capital and a military uh, and military enthralled ruling circle in the capital from being able to launch wars because there is some restraint from a public that's heard all this before and been dragged into wars. That's less so in the United States, perhaps. It was surprisingly uh, easy, not a snap job, they did have to work at it, but surprisingly easy for uh, the Bush administration in 2002, 2003, to be able to, what some might say, cast a spell over the American political class and public and win endorsement for an invasion of Iraq. But the consequences of that war have interestingly led not only to uh, regrets on the invasion itself, but have led the public to a much wider disillusionment with the notion that was extant even during the Clinton years of America as having global responsibilities to maintain peace and to, in the terminology of the day, uh, and to, uh, to keep uh, violators of international norms in line. Now, plainly, Ambassador Kamal was playing with us when he said that dictatorships do not go to war, that they all love the status quo. One doesn't have to think very far back in history to think of dictators uh, who wanted to revise the status quo the only way they knew how. And the, the most famous examples, of course, were the revisionist dictatorships, the fascist dictatorships of the 1930s and 40s. But more recently in yeah, our but, time, but remember, more recently no, 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 in our just time, a minute. Remember well, 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 let me finish the sentence. Germany was that of Iraq in, in 1990. But Mr. Hitler emerged out of democracy. He was elected the head of Germany. But Hitler so was not able to take Germany into war until he had removed all trappings of democratic control. It was a year and a half long process in Germany. It was a four-year process for Mussolini in Italy to strip away the democratic institutions and establish a highly charismatic one-man rule. And literally, in the case of Germany, the entire regime hung on uh, the Führer, on the, the one leader. Uh, and it was the steely will of one dictator, one individual, uh, that was able to drag not only Germany, but all of Europe into the abyss. So really this notion of dictators, A, loving the status quo, when the, their motivation was to overturn it, and B, being peace-loving people, and it's only these democratic societies in which certain interest groups are able to uh, beat the war drums and lead their country into war, is grossly exaggerated. Because the fact is that in most democratic societies, there are enough reasons for enough people to say, we don't want to pay the taxes for a war. We don't want to pay the costs in lives of a war. 
to exercise a brake on the accelerator interval. Obviously, in the United States, that brake failed, that braking system failed in 2002, 2003. But by and large, uh, most democratic countries don't have this enthusiasm for war, particularly if their peoples have experienced the bitter lash of war in their historical memories. Uh, let me throw another idea out at you so that you can continue to destroy my ideas. Uh, the concept of peace, somehow we have fooled ourselves into believing that peace is not just a desirable but a feasible objective. But the history of the world is not the history of peace. The history of the world is the history of wars. It is the history of ugliness and wars and domination and conquest. And that is why all the, the world that we see today is the result of expansion. And so you are talking like Jesus Christ when you talk of peace. But Jesus Christ is having no, no say in the world today. This is well, a actually, Jesus Christ world. has surprising say for somebody who's been dead or at least was killed 2,000 years ago. Enough people continue to advocate the ideas that are associated with his name that uh, they still have a certain amount of currency. I think that that's pretty remarkable. Uh, uh, and I would also point out that someone frozen in the f ways of thinking of the Middle Ages, uh, like Ambassador Kamal perhaps, I don't know, uh, uh, might not appreciate how the world has changed in the past century. When you think, Ambassador Kamal, 100 years ago, 1913, Europe dominated the world stage, the notion of imperialism, of empires in which the strong uh, controlled the weak across the world was deeply ingrained in European capitals. Uh, and had fanciful advocates in some other capitals as well. And yet, in the span of 30, 40 years, the entire notion of the legitimacy of the strong being able to rule and having the right to rule the weak was totally shattered. It did take two global wars to uh, explode the mindset, the mentality of imperialism. But after the Second World War, those big European empires were in quick retreat. That's what let guys like you suddenly be able to take over large swaths of land like Pakistan, run them, and then come to the UN and berate the Western countries for their attachment to these democratic ideals because the, the notion of empire in which you, uh, those within the, then it was called Indian subcontinent, including what is now Pakistan and Bangladesh, uh, that, uh, that people like yourselves were able to assert independence. And there is indeed a wholly new spirit that I would say is one of the major achievements of the United Nations idea and United Nations institutions. Uh, so the, the United Nations represents the embodiment of a democratic vision embracing all of humankind. Uh, and so the big European empires were uh, forced to retreat, uh, not always gracefully, and some of them tried to cling to their imperial holdings to, uh, to great misfortune. Uh, the French in particular were the greatest clingers and the biggest losers. Uh, but uh, the, it, we also had in those institutions of the UN a framework for the new emerging nations to take their place, to be able to raise issues in a, quote, democratic, semi-democratic, pseudo-parliamentary process uh, for consensus building and forging common action. Now, that is different, Ambassador Kamal, than the history of thousands of years of empire builders. Uh, an Alexander the Conqueror, a Caesar, uh, the um, Shah Jahan, uh, you know, whether it be in India or China uh, or the Mediterranean or Northern Europe, the notion of the strong man who conquers others and thus creates peace for a short while is discredited. And uh, the, we have already embraced the fundamental idea of, 
of a more or less international, somewhat democratic order as the best cornerstone of long-term stability and longer-term peace. And those institutions have been part of why there has not been a great power war since September 1st, 1945. Yes, but let me then throw out another idea. Throw it out. <clears throat> the defense of the system that you are talking about, which is the United Nations system, is based on the concept of the member state and its sovereignty. And this member state has a border. And so the definition of the status quo today in the UN is in the sanctity of the border. But these borders are totally artificial. Most of them, particularly in Africa, were drafted by a bunch of drunken politicians in the Congress of Berlin who would sozzle themselves with whiskey. And after they were completely drunk, they would pull out a map and draw lines on it and say, this is your country and this is my country. That is how <clears throat> the borders of Africa were drawn up. Is that how the border of Pakistan was drawn the up? The border of Pakistan was drawn up by the British who turned up as a colonial power and reduced India from 30% of the world's economy 250 years ago to 3% of the world's economy today because they came to India and sucked up all the factories and all the economy of India. And so there is a criminality of behavior in the Western civilization that you are defending. They have destroyed the concept of stability which existed in the world 250 years ago. And so the question now is that we have to go through a readjustment of those borders. And how will we do that? Because <clears throat> and that is what is happening in Africa today. Why are we having problems in Rwanda? Why are we having problems in the Congo? Because they are purely artificial borders. Well, they're not so much the, the, the cause or the result of artificial borders as the result of having uh, identity groups, usually ethnic groups, sometimes religiously identified groups, uh, living in close proximity that do not share a sense of identity with the other and have instead a, a deep suspicion. Your own subcontinent, uh, the then Indian subcontinent, vast, uh, with many languages, uh, a number of religious traditions, uh, many Muslims in that subcontinent figured that they could not survive uh, as Muslims and did not want to be Muslims within a larger state that was overwhelmingly non-Muslim and insisted on carving out an identity-based state uh, of Pakistan in which Muslims could feel free to live a Muslim life that the state would reinforce rather than being constantly in the shadow of somebody else's notions of, of religion and of the proper state. So Pakistan was hived off from uh, the, the rest of India, leaving many Muslims behind uh, and a, a fair number of non-Muslims within the territory of that great Indus River Valley area that is now Pakistan. Uh, so we've already had some drawing of the borders and how many people were killed in partition. It was a terrible exercise. The African governments that emerged from colonial rule very early on decided that the common policy for all of them would be no efforts to change the borders, that people of different ethnic groups, tribal identities, language groups, within all of those African, quote, states, feeble as the state apparatus might have been in most of them, they all agreed we're not going to try to change borders and that we are not going to create of these states what Europeans had created as so-called nation states in that original sense of nation as deriving from common birth. Uh, as those of you who would know Latin would see the, the etymology of that word uh, that has so roiled so much of Europe more recent, in more recent years, particularly in Eastern Europe. Uh, so I think trying to undo borders, walk back borders, uh, would be difficult indeed. And it's very hard to imagine different kinds of borderlines 
that would create so-called nation states in Africa, given the mixing of language groups and ethnic groups across so much of that, uh, that continent. Uh, what we, the problems in Africa now, particularly the northern third, derive from the religious side. The, and uh, the, the, the biggest issue right now that preoccupies American, French, and, and, uh, and, uh, and UN planners, and most West African governments, is the Al-Qaeda-linked jihadist movement that has been penetrating across the Sahara, and most spectacularly in recent months, in Mali. But let us, uh, you have now opened the whole concept of the right of self-determination. And that brings us back to the subject of Pittsburgh, when they said democracy and peace. And the question is, <clears throat> the right of self-determination is a very important right. Uh, but the right of self-determination can also result in the fragmentation of the nation state. And in some cases, it can result in the consolidation of a nation state. You had a Europe with different nation states, and they decided to consolidate themselves in something called the European Union. This is a repeat of what happened in the United States. This country was 13 independent states, and they said we need to consolidate ourselves into a common country. And so they called themselves, they joined together, and they went into the United States of America. It wasn't easy. A hundred years later, they had to go through a civil war in order to really consolidate. And even today, the people in Texas say, we are special. We are not Yankees like all these people in Pittsburgh. We are very special. And so the right of self-determination, you have to recognize that there is a certain ethnicity in peoples. There's a certain culture in peoples. And so are you going to defend the border or are you going to defend the ethnicities? Because the ethnicities are not being defended in uh, Africa, which is why we had the problem that we had in Rwanda. Well, I think that the European experience is, is quite different from that in Africa. Uh, first, even the European experience now of gradual integration of a, an increasingly federal Europe is a much more arduous undertaking than the creation of a federation of the Amer those initially fragile American states along the, uh, the Atlantic seaboard in the late 1700s. Because at least those American states uh, had had a common English ancestry. And they saw themselves uh, as having that much in common. It's a far more amazing project what the Europeans uh, have been pulling off of integrating countries of different languages, different national identities within the, uh, the framework of a common Europeanness. And as the British Prime Minister's speech earlier this week um, in Amsterdam is made clear, uh, you still have pockets of resistance to the European idea in conservative circles, certainly in Britain, uh, but also in some other capitals. But as Ambassador Kamal pointed out, we also have a, a good deal of, of centrifugal, no, centripetal, I guess it is, uh, of forces, uh, no, centrifugal to break away from uh, existing states. Spain faces possible Catalan secession. Britain faces the Scottish demand for a referendum on independence. Uh, we had already seen the disintegration of the Yugoslav Federation of different nationalities very bloodily, uh, uh, that divorce in the 1990s, the much more peaceful divorce between Czechs and Slovaks, uh, and the, uh, the divorce within the Soviet Union once the Soviet repressive apparatus was withdrawn. Uh, all of those republics, most of which had a majority ethnic identity, quickly deciding they did not want to be harnessed to a union uh, any longer. Uh, and that was done reasonably peacefully. Uh, so uh, all this is part of, I would suggest, uh, how the new world order since mid 20th century has created new realities in which the spread of democratic ideas, 
the spread of the notion of human rights and minority rights has created the foundations for politics to be played out through peaceful means uh, and for differences either to be reconciled or groups to divorce without huge wars. And it is a more peaceful world now than it was 100 years ago, than it was 60 years ago. And for that, we should be grateful. And I think that we should be grateful to the spread of uh, some democratic ideas, many of them lodged in 1945 in that UN Charter, for making that transition possible. Let's take some questions from Pittsburgh. Over to you for questions from your side. Sarah again. Um, I just wanted to ask about um, what you guys, both of you, uh, thought about the Arab Spring social movements and sort of like the responsibility of both the international community and the United States to either promote democracy or to help out with the efforts in these countries. You want to take it first? All right, let, let me take a first crack at that, Sarah. First, I don't think that there is any internationally uh, recognized legal responsibility to promote democracy. Rather, there is an international responsibility chiseled into the UN Charter to promote respect for human rights. Now, among human rights is, uh, as defined initially in the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948, and then codified in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, an instrument of international law, not simply rhetoric, a rhetorical declaration, uh, the, the right of people to choose their governments through periodic free and fair elections. So the notion of democracy uh, has now been woven into international law uh, as part of the promotion of human rights. But it is the human rights that are central. Quite frankly, if you go even to Americans and ask them whether the U.S. should be supporting democracy around the world, you'll get a tepid answer. But if you ask, should it be promoting human rights? Yes. And why is that? Because people in their heads, many people, not political junkies like us here, you and, and, and we, but many people kind of see democracy as the means by which the people are allowed the occasional say in which group of corrupt leaders in some places or political leaders are going to run our lives. So they're a little disillusioned about politics. But when you ask about their human rights, they see that is directly affecting what they are empowered to do and able to do and their own personal space for living their lives. So human rights is a much more powerful and affective uh, issue on which to ground international uh, support and international efforts. And on that, Arab Spring certainly engages the international community first and foremost as opening opportunities of respect for human rights, including the political rights, uh, the democratic rights. Um, but the, it, it has also, in some areas, found such deeply entrenched uh, governments uh, in power, political elites, uh, that refuse to turn over power to a popular process and that have, because of other deep divisions within those societies in some cases, led to explosions of what can only be called civil war. Uh, we did find enough international consensus to, to have international military intervention not uh, notionally to protect endangered civilians in Libya, but uh, the way in which that was carried out in 2011 ensured a good deal of resistance from skeptical major states such as Russia and China uh, when the Syrian case uh, came up. And in Syria, we've had over 60,000 people killed uh, and there is no clear way forward on which the entire international community can yet agree. Yes, but I would like to add that um, the concept of regime change 
is not your responsibility. It's not Mr. Laurenti's responsibility either. He can have ideas, but it's not his business. The business of regime change is the business of the people of a state themselves. If they want to change, fine. If they don't want to change, fine. And if they change in a direction which you don't like, which Mr. Laurenti does not like, bully for him. That's his problem. And so I'm sorry, we cannot defend the idea of regime change from external uh, points into a internal country. And that is the position of Russia and China insofar as Syria is concerned. They say, none of your business. And they are right. Was that the position of Pakistan in 1980 regarding regime change in Afghanistan? Pakistan and Afghanistan have been one country. Oh, now, now Pakistan views Afghanistan as part of its own territory. Of course, Afghanistan oh. has ruled Pakistan for 300 years. So now you would accept Afghan kings ruling Pakistan today. We have today. always said that we would be happy to have a confederation between Iran, Afghanistan and Pakistan of the same type as the confederation in the United States. This has been a constant position of our... And how would we, the leaders we, of that we, confederation be chosen? That we will decide. No, you will not decide that. I will decide that. You will decide that or course, your generals will decide no, no, that? You have no place in this debate. Or the all. mullahs in Tehran you, will you, decide you that. You are just an ugly American trying to conduct regime change in the rest of the world. And I don't give you that right. You have no position in Syria. And all of us know that the only reason why you are getting so worked up about Syria is? is because of Iran. You are worried about Iran having an entry into Hezbollah and uh, Hamas. It already has that entry. Yeah, and that is why you are worried. So you, you are not... Well, that's not the only reason. That's it's not the only reason. 90% of the reason. 80%. 80%. <laughs> <laughs> But you understand that we have a difference of opinion. I am for human rights. But human when did that happen? Yes, it happened a long time ago. So. <laughs> I am for human rights. We have a whole session on human rights two weeks from today and we'll go deep into it. But human rights is a, it's a policy. It's not a tool for foreign policy. And you have converted it into a foreign policy tool. And so you see human rights violations in Syria and you do not see human rights violations in Israel. Well, how is that that you are so selective? Well, the rest of the international community to, today, certainly sees human no, rights sir, violations no, in just Israel. just a minute. Today, today, the uh, United Nations has issued a report on human rights violations in the occupied territories. And Israel has rejected the whole report totally. And the United States has kept silent. How the, can you keep silent on a neutral, impartial report prepared by a non-Arab on violations in Israel and which Israel rejects totally? And you keep quiet? Where is well, your... Well, first, where I mean, is your you, we're talking about the same day news cycle, so I don't know that the U.S. government has re been silent until 4.35 p.m., whatever time it is right now. Uh, on the report, and this is a report of experts, jur expert jurists on the, for the benefit of, of the students who may not have seen today's newsreel, uh, on the, uh, the legality of the placement of Israeli settlements or colonies inside the territory of what had been Arab-ruled Palestine, the West Bank and, and East Jerusalem. Uh, a project that's been going on now for the better part of 40 years. Uh, and uh, it's one in which the United States government has variously described those settlements as illegal under President Carter, uh, to unhelpful under President Reagan, to illegitimate by President Obama. Uh, and I don't know if they've yet issued a statement on this report, but the United States government did rebuke Israel two days ago for refusing to appear before the Human Rights Council for, to, uh, for the hearing on the, the periodic review of Israel's human rights performance. Uh, every other country in the world, from the United States to Iran, has gone in to defend its human rights 
record and accept criticisms uh, in this periodic review process, the peer review process. And Israel had accepted that in 2008 under a different government. The Netanyahu government has decided to stonewall the UN Human Rights Council on this very important process. And the US government uh, uncharacteristically uh, piped up to say it thought it was unwise for the Israelis to do so, uh, and, do, and does see it as a threat to the entire human rights machinery of the UN. Because if the Israelis walk out because they don't want to hear criticism of what their policies are, then North Korea, Iran, anybody else that feels it would be criticized uh, can walk out in the whole uh, UN human rights machinery that has been put together since 2005 around a new Human Rights Council uh, then comes undone. We have the same circus that we had had for 30 years before. Yes, but you notice that we are back to the subject of democracy and peace. Israel is a democracy. Israel yeah. holds free elections. Yes. So I if accept, that's the definition. I, I accept that Israel is a democracy. Here is what it has done. Number one, it has refused to come in front of the Human Rights Council for periodic review. Number two, it has rejected an impartial United Nations report on the legality of the settlements. And number three, it has physically committed aggression against Syria by bombing inside Syria. And this is a democracy. And so I, I, that is why I say, why are you encouraging Pittsburgh to create a link between democracy and peace? Democracies do not create peace. Here is the example of a democracy which is not creating peace. I think Israel is very much sui generis of, of its own kind uh, in any number of ways. So one can hardly see a um, Israeli behavior as indicative of the democratic norm. Uh, I mean, Israel is as a democratic regime within its 1967 borders, at least. It's a democratic regime, uh, but it behaves as an occupying power on the territories it gained control of in the June 1967 war. And there, the Palestinians have no legal rights uh, to participate in the decision-making of those who are their masters. Uh, although there has been the, the half-step towards creation of the Palestinian Authority uh, and its legislative council, which is now effectively a suspended political process that may or may not be restarted. Uh, but. Uh, the Israelis certainly are in an unusually defensive position with regard to host some hostile neighbors, uh, and uh, they have their own internal conflicts about whether Israel is a state carved out of, through partition, the old Palestine territory, whether it should be entitled to all the land between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean, which ultranationalists have been pushing quite aggressively there. And the politics of the new government's formation turns an awful lot on that debate. Okay, let's take another question from Pittsburgh. Hello, my name is Lily and I'm a communication major. I want to ask you guys about how America's use of drones has been viewed in the international community or even just by the American public. Is it, does anyone think it's any more humanitarian or peaceful or is it just as ruthless as God? That's a great question. I would like to add a supplementary to that. And the supplementary is, when it is a question of security, then you try to go beyond international law and sovereignty, because security is more important than law. And so the use of the drones is driven by an American perception of its own security. And it is opposed by what you call international law. Which of the two is more important, security or international law? Well, uh, the use of drones for carrying out attacks against uh, suspected enemies of the American state uh, became uh, the, uh, you might say, the kind of military drug of choice uh, in the first decade of this century. And it was wildly popular in Washington. No risk for American uh, military personnel, 
uh, so-called clean strikes suddenly from the air, wiping out nests of, uh, of Al-Qaeda terrorists. And uh, it became such a, a seductive kind of weapon uh, that the Obama administration tripled the number of drone strikes, and Ambassador Kamal's own home country of Pakistan has been the unhappy recipient of these ministrations from the air. Uh, an ever-increasing number, and the government in Pakistan in the past two years has begun to push back very hard against the promiscuous use of these drones and the, uh, the almost video game warfare style of, uh, of administering these lethal attacks. As I say, that they were quite popular and unquestioned in Washington until the Al-Laki killing in Yemen uh, two years ago. Uh, and that only because the victim was a U.S. citizen and it began to raise doubts. Wait, can the President of the United States decide, without there being any trial, that he can authorize a lethal attack on an American citizen anywhere in the world by this remote-controlled kind of, of weaponry? Internationally, the concern about the, the use of drones for military strikes had already been growing and growing very strong. The UN has had in the Human Rights Council a rapporteur, namely one who writes a report, a rapporteur on extrajudicial killings for over 30 years. Washington was quite upset when the rapporteur on extrajudicial killings began to turn his attention from the kind of uh, run-of-the-mill garden variety, you know, governments assassinating political opponents or tossing them in the slammer and their bodies being then found on a street uh, a month or so later to these strikes from the air. And there is uh, now underway a study by the another UN Special Rapporteur for Human Rights on Human Rights and Counterterrorism by the name of Ben Emerson, Double M. Emerson of Britain, looking into the deaths of civilians caused by drone strikes and whether these, in fact, are violations of the laws of war. The international machinery uh, works slowly often, but it's obviously faster than Washington coming to its senses about difficult political issues when, as Ambassador Kamal is saying, the notion of security, uh, particularly against terrorism, is so deeply ingrained and so reflexive a political plus in Washington politics. Yes, but uh, uh, I don't think the question has been answered. I the, answer Lily's question. Yeah, the question is, is the use of drones an example of aggression? Because you are violating the sovereignty of somebody else with an aggressive act. And if it is... Well, so let's take he, Pakistan. Is it, is it, no, just a minute. Just oh, let's not yes take no. Pakistan. Is it aggression or not? Well, if there are attacks that are being launched by people against whom these drone strikes are a defense, then no, that is not an act of aggression. So if a drone strike uh, uh, takes out a perpetrator of violent attacks across the border into Afghanistan, uh, who is operating in Pakistan, where the Pakistani authorities are unable to enforce their own laws, is that aggression? I think that there is a strong argument under international law to be said, no, that's not aggression. That is, That can be justified as, as the self-defense of not only the Americans, but the Afghan government and, it's, uh, and, uh, and at the Afghan public against that kind of attacker operating from a mountainous sanctuary across the border in another country where that country's own government is unable to exercise effective police control. When those strikes begin taking out wedding parties and dozens of civilians, that raises the issue, as the rapporteur on extrajudicial killings has said, that raises the issue of a war crime, multiplied many times over, it seems, in Pakistan, uh, and leading to questions about the the degree of effective control, there were bitter battles between the U.S. ambassador in Pakistan and the CIA about the CIA deciding to make 
uh, strikes uh, in Pakistani territory uh, that the ambassador thought would be politically disastrous. Yeah, I don't want to be the devil's advocate. You are always the devil's I, I advocate. I know, but that's because I am the devil. But the, the question is, what is the difference between a drone strike against the sovereignty of Pakistan and the Osama bin Laden raid? Exactly. And the Al-Qaeda raid against the Twin Towers because Al-Qaeda says my rights have been dominated by the United States and Israel. They are constantly interfering with my right. They are sustaining non-democratic regimes in our countries, totally non-democratic monarchies. And so we have to react. And so they are defending their vision of their own sovereignty. Ambassador and Kamal, security. do you see a distinction? Uh, just take the September 11th attacks no, between they, the attack no, on the Pentagon no, and the attack on the World Trade Center? Of course there's a difference, because in the World Trade Center, 3,000 people died, and in the Pentagon... All civilians. Okay, but... Who had... It could not, by the, any wildest stretch of the imagination, the drone be seen as, uh, as part of the American military imperial project. But Mr. Laurenti, in the drone strikes, more people have died than in 9-11. Which more, drone strike took 3,000 lives? 7,500 Pakistanis and Afghans have died. What are you talking about? You don't count because you're not interested in the number of deaths in Afghanistan and Pakistan. You only count American deaths. You're not worried at all. Can you tell me how many people died in Iraq as a result of the Iraq operation? No, you're we don't have interested. hard numbers, but it's at least 100,000. Yeah, because you don't count. You only count yourself. And I think there's something wrong if you only look at yourself and don't look at me. So I want you to look at me. I'm looking at you, <laughs> Ambassador Kamal. Over to you for a question from your end. <laughs> Hi, my name is Kelsey. I'm a political science and philosophy major. Um, and I was going to ask, in the book Perpetual Peace by Immanuel Kant, Kant formulated the democratic peace theory, which states that democracies don't go to war with one another. And in this, he posited several ways to facilitate peace among states. And one of the way is by spreading democracy. And I just wanted to know if that was a valid solution to the end goal of peace and your standpoint. Well, I think we... Not at all. After all, how can you ask this question? The Britain was a democracy and the United States was a democracy. And Britain went to war against the United States and prevented it from becoming independent. And so... How can we say that democracies don't go to war with each other? The history of France and the history of Britain is a history of constant wars with each other, though both of them were relatively democratic regimes. And so... For they, most of history, it was the King of England and the King of France who, for their various ambitions, were fighting wars with each other. And so it's with it the is, growth of democracy... The corporate kings of Look America. at your... Look, and the non-corporate kings of other countries. So well, always look at Europe. Europe since 1945, Western Europe first, uh, with the spread of democracy and its taking root, even in the countries that had just undergone uh, the, uh, the fantasy grip of the fascist governments in Italy and Germany, Italy, excuse me, Europe has, been, has created a sustainable peace uh, in a continent that had been riven by frequent wars uh, and that is in part a sign of the progress of democracy helping lay the foundations for peace. Now, Kelsey, I don't buy Kant's theory per se. And in fact, the first 40 minutes of our discussion today, I think, had largely debunked it. Uh, but I do think that the spread of democracy does contribute to uh, the foundations of peace, but it is not in itself a full and necessary uh, and adequate explanation for what takes peace. You also need development. You need some level of removal of people from misery, poverty, uh, and want, uh, because even in a democracy, and we saw this from ancient Athens to the ancient Roman Republic, that the, uh, the poorer masses could be stampeded into favoring war when the war would seem to offer either the prospect of booty or some other way of advancing their own condition. When you have a broad middle class, uh, when you have broadly shared wealth, you create an innate caution uh, 
against these military entanglements. Doesn't always work. It was the United States in 1845 that launched the war with Mexico for pure aggressive purposes. Some would say that that was a reflection of the political hand of the slaveholding South, which was the primary driver for the war, uh, which was itself an anti-democratic impulse, but nonetheless within the, the, the game of American politics at the time, a democratic system in many ways uh, was able to railroad the country into uh, its most uh, uh, embarrassing uh, act of aggression. Over to you for a question from your end. Yeah, Ron Ria, I'm a philosophy major, and I also study European Union studies uh, here at the university. And um, so my, my question, I, I want to re-examine the um, relationship between democracy and peace. And uh, I think before we can posit a causal connection in any way, we have to um, have concrete and realizable definitions for our terms. And I think one of the biggest problems with uh, any peace theory that's been proposed is that we don't have a realizable, concrete, and pragmatic definition of peace. I mean, if we simply call it non-war, I still think that leaves it wholly ambiguous. So my question is, is to both of you is, um, how in, uh, in, in, in our possible world can we dip, create an operative definition of peace? And uh, do we have historical examples um, that would refer to a peaceful scenario or an ideal peaceful state? I think that's a great question because you have questioned the fundamental definition of peace as uh, the opposite of war. But you can have peace which is not quite the opposite of war. You can have war by other means. And for example, you can have war by the exploitation of other countries in their economy and in their resources, which is the concept of neo-colonialism. And that sounds as if it is not war, but it is actually war. And this is what we, we see this as a problem in the Congo today. The Congo, as you know, is a huge country. It's almost the size of the United States. It has nine neighbors. It has the richest resource base in the world. They are full of gold and minerals and everything in the Congo. And all the nine countries around it have got their straws into the blood of the Congo and they are sipping, uh, sucking out the blood of the Congo. And that is the problem of the Congo. Now you can say this is not war. It is just uh, economic exploitation. But economic exploitation is as much war as physical aggression. And so your question is totally legitimate because how is it that we have so much inequality in the world? How is it that you have a growing inequality? When you examine the world 40 years ago, the average richer countries were 40 times richer than the average poorer countries. Today, the average richer countries are 90 times richer than the average poorer countries. These are World Bank figures which means that inequality has doubled in the past 40 or 50 years. How can you defend that? Is that inequality peace? Or is it a result of somehow are not doing enough in order to create a better and more human world? And so, sir? Well, certainly the trend towards greater inequality is something that exists not only among states, but within states. Uh, and we have certainly experienced that in the past 30 years in the United States. Last year's election was in part fought over uh, the growing inequality and whether people viewed it as a problem or not. Now, it's hard to impute uh, to an election result uh, any single cause uh, or which particular issue may have motivated it, but it's fair to say that maybe 47% of the American electorate does not view uh, the issue of inequality as dispositive uh, in its... Um, uh, as dispositive? What does that mean? Meaning as the issue on which uh, they think the, uh, an election should be decided. It's not the issue on which uh, 
they would put a new government in, in power. Uh, that inequality is not as important for a large share, but it, it seems a minority of the population. And we saw that played out in the battle, very narrowly circumscribed on whether or not to raise income taxes on the top 1% or half of a percent so, of so the of population. So inequality no, is really, an issue domestically as well as globally. So people are happy in the United States. I didn't the say that. that. Some of them are earning $5 an hour in McDonald's and others are earning $110 million a you year. Have, you have a, a substantial minority of the American public that says, that's life. Take it. You know, live with it. Uh, that's what a, a capitalist economy produces and, uh, so, and it accepts the allocations of wealth based on a, a free market economy as inherently just. A majority of the... And, and you are... A majority a of the electorate... You are a believer a majority in, Jesus, of the in Jesus Christ? The, ask who, them. Who ask said, those people. Bless, that share blessed of the, are the poor and turn your other cheek and look for equality? And you call yourself Christians in this country? But you're not directing the question to me. I am I directing the you're question You're directing the you. question to the 47%. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, and you have that's part of the American political polemic, whether in fact... Uh, and indeed, within major Christian religious communities, whether the emphasis of Christianity in politics should be on issues of poverty and justice, so-called social justice, or issues of, of uh, sexual morality uh, and such, and you have different tendencies. But let me go to Ron's larger point about what constitutes peace. You don't have a definition in the UN Charter. You don't have any definition in UN documents of what peace is. Uh, the Roman historian Tacitus famously said that the Romans, quote, made a desert and called it peace. You can have Stalin's peace, in which through uh, severe repression and instilling terror in the population, everybody bites his tongue uh, and does what he's told and goes through make-believe uh, demonstrations of love and loyalty to the great man who's leading them into the, uh, on the road to a socialist paradise. You can have a, a but it clearly, an absence of war is part of whatever is the positive condition of peace. Um, but as we were discussing before, among the elements of an, a durable peace are not just the absence of fighting today, but a sense that a society whether within a county, whether within a state, country, or globally, uh, is based on reasonably fair principles. Uh, this goes to the heart of legitimacy. Now, legality is often tied to legitimacy. If something is legal, it may enjoy a presumption of being legitimate unless the legality is itself so glaringly seen as unjust. For example, in the American southern states in the 1850s, legality was based on racial oppression and slavery. Um, in, in, in such a circumstance, legality has lost legitimacy. Uh, but normally, uh, if, if something is legal, it has the, uh, the presumption of being legitimate uh, and that is based on people's instinctive sense of what is just, uh, what is justice. Uh, and peace requires the citizenry, the public, to see that existing order as being in some way legitimate, that they accept the decisions that come out of its political and social processes as, as fair a way of making decisions uh, as can be done. That is the cornerstone of long-term peace. Over to you for a question from your end. Mr. And Mr. Laurenti, um, I'm Professor Smith. And um, one of the things we're teaching and learning in this class about and reading a lot about is the ways of NGOs have become more active in global politics and at the United Nations. And um, so it would be good for the students, I think, to learn a little bit about the Century Foundation and your work as an NGO, but also maybe you can comment a little more generally about 
um, the question of have NGOs um, at the UN been contributing to democracy and peace in the UN and in the world? All right, let me dispose of Century Foundation and the Think Tank Network uh, quickly because they, they have a role that they contribute, that is advancing ideas in the policy debate, uh, research uh, that leads to uh, policy recommendations that the political class may or may not respond to. Uh, they are not the core of uh, non-governmental organizations, the NGOs, uh, as they have developed around the UN and in our national and state capitals uh, as well. Uh, most NGOs have an advocacy purpose. There is a particular set of causes around which they organize. Some of these NGOs have large membership bases, so they represent some segments of society that people can freely join or freely drop out of. So the question, and I, I would expect Ambassador Kamal, uh, who ought to jump in on this uh, in a moment, will uh, uh, properly pose is, who are these NGOs? American conservatives uh, who view these NGOs as good government, limp-wristed do-gooders who get in the way of hard-nosed political uh, realpolitik uh, we'll ask that. Uh, former uh, Ambassador President Bush's personal emissary to the UN in the middle of the last decade, John Bolton, was determined to exclude these NGOs because they aren't representative of the American people. The U.S. government is representative of the American people. Now, frankly, it is the NGOs that have pressed the envelope to go beyond governments. It was NGOs that pressed the notion in the San Francisco UN Charter Conference of 1945 that the new organization should not be, like the League of Nations preamble, a covenant among the high contracting parties, but rather that the new organization is, quote, we the peoples of the United Nations. And that was the major transformation at mid-century uh, from the first tentative efforts at global association and a league uh, to the United Nations, the very weak confederacy that we have at the center of global uh, uh, politics uh, today. And NGOs were specifically enshrined in this new organization. Uh, and in fact, it was NGOs that pressed for the human rights mandate in the UN Charter. It wasn't the US government on its own initiative, but the uh, the human rights groups that clustered around the convention writing, excuse me, the charter writing conference in San Francisco that insisted that human rights had to be part of this. And indeed, that was a brilliant insight because going back to Ron's question, seeing human rights, seeing rising standards of living as crucial dimensions of that central purpose of the UN organization, the preservation of peace, uh, has been crucial in assuring the legitimacy of all. Uh, I'd like to comment on this because uh, it's quite clear that Mr. Laurenti has a very poor opinion of me because he <laughs> believes that I am against NGOs and he could not be more wrong in this as in all the other things that he has spoken about today. The fact of the matter is that I am considered in the UN as the champion of the NGOs. In the 1990s, I was asked to chair for five years a consultation of all the member states to see whether the NGOs could be given deeper access into the United Nations. And I was chosen for that purpose because of a feeling that I had and a passion that I had that NGOs represented the conscience of the world that they were the real peoples, and that when the Charter said, we the peoples, as the opening words, it then made a mistake in interpreting the peoples as governments, which is not fair, because peoples are not represented by governments, not even the best of democracies that Mr. De Mr. Laurenti defends here today. In the best of democracies, peoples are represented by only 
by their governments. And so we had a problem. And I found that when we tried to give greater access to the NGOs, the following countries, and this is now because it has passed history, I can give you the names. The countries that supported me in saying, yes, NGOs should be given deeper access were the Scandinavians, all of them, Netherlands, uh, uh, New Zealand, Australia, Canada, Mexico, Costa Rica. That's it. And, Where is Cuba? and, and Ireland. No, forget Cuba. Don't don't be uh, don't keep on to your task of provoking me. <laughs> <laughs> and so so these were the countries that supported me. The countries that opposed me in giving deeper access to the NGOs were the United States, Britain, France, Russia, China, India, Egypt, Brazil. So you see, it was an, a, a fight in which I was going to lose. And it was it. I must say that I was an absolute foolish person because it took me five years to understand how they were trying to make a monkey out of me. And my hair was totally black when I started that consultation. And look at it now, all because of the countries that oppose the idea of giving the NGOs greater access. Now, having said that, the NGOs represent the decency and the conscience of the world. They have done great work as think tanks like the Century Foundation, as people at the spearhead of movements like the uh, Anti-Personal Landmines Treaty, which is an NGO uh, uh, result, or the human rights concepts, all these are NGO contributions. And so we have to defend the NGOs. But the problem is that states, governments don't like NGOs because it's a question of power sharing and governments don't like to share power. Let me, add, let me add one additional uh, thought that your reflections uh, have, uh, have uh, surfaced in, in me. Uh, what Ambassador Kamal points to in the Landmines Treaty uh, and another case would be the International Criminal Court yes. are examples of where uh, non-governmental organizations uh, that Professor Smith asked about have made a huge difference in effect seizing control of the international agenda from the dead hands of governments and instead embracing the wider aspirations of humanity and putting justice, fairness, legitimacy uh, forward uh, and protection of human lives in the case of landmines when governments didn't want to hear it. When I had related how uh, former Ambassador uh, Bolton uh, had sneered at the notion of NGO access and listening to NGOs, when you take a look at those two recent treaties as a case in point, treaty law that was driven not by the big powers, but by the NGOs that may have been active in some of those big powers and created a public pressure that the real politic crowd in some of those governments would otherwise have just dismissed as fatuously idealistic. Uh, remember, though, that NGOs are not always simply goody-goody, two-shoes, uh, liberal-minded, uh, self-appointed guardians of their own interests. The National Rifle Association now in the United States now has NGO status at the UN. The Bush administration had fought hard for it to get that status. There were some suspicions about whether the NRA met the UN standard of having UN interests within its mandate. Uh, the other thing to note, Professor Smith, is that the organ of the United Nations that takes direct NGO input is the Economic and Social Council and all of the subsidiary commissions and bodies that report to it, and now the Human Rights Council, which has been carved out of Economic and Social Council jurisdiction. Uh, and uh, that's where you have NGOs accredited to be able to speak directly in their own name at UN deliberations. The great powers whom Ambassador Kamal referred to would think it anathema to have 
any kind of NGO input into the work of the Security Council. And yet we do have NGOs that are dedicated to peace or to disarmament and such, but they don't have access to the UN Security Council. There are no formal mechanisms for NGO input into the work of the Security Council. Although increasingly we have developed in the outer corridors around the Security Council, uh, NGO inputs, uh, women, uh, women's groups, particularly on the engagement of women in peace building and conflict resolution uh, and, uh, and other groups uh, on the outer margins, but they never get a formal role uh, to address the council uh, because the big powers don't want them mucking around in high affairs of state. I just want to add one more point. NGOs include universities because universities are think tanks and at least 20 universities have accreditation as NGOs in the United Nations and I am the person who brought them in one by one. And so I would encourage Pittsburgh to apply for NGO status and to get in accreditation into the UN because it is important. And not only do you get accreditation, but now we have moved to a second stage in which the universities who are accredited are being brought together as under what is called the academic impact, which is a consolidation of universities into the UN to see how can we build up a better relationship between the United Nations and universities. And so there is a great role for all of you. You are as much of a think tank in, the, in Professor Smith's class as uh, Mr. Laurenti in the Century Foundation. So think. <laughs> thank you. Thank I you leave it so to much. you to decide whether we have time for one more question or whether we are out of time. I think we are about out of time, but thank you both so much for your comments and especially Ambassador Kamal. I believe we ran out of time just when we've gotten to um, the point in our discussion where we can begin to really talk about specifically what are some of those ways that we can get more involved as NGOs and as universities running on the ground. But I thank you so much for being able to get that comment in at the last moment. Um, and for both of you for um, just your, your very valuable inputs. Um, you've certainly given us a great place to sort of hit the ground running in class um, to begin to talk about these things more um, in terms of practically what, what does that look like for us as a university um, and for us connected to um, sort of NGOs and, and the UN. So thank you both so much for your time. Um, and yeah, thank and you on, may, on behalf of the class. And may I, on your behalf and on my own, may I thank Mr. Laurenti for taking me in such good spirit because he is a formidable uh, <laughs> partner and I am always scared to sit with him. Uh, and thank God I was sitting on his right. So there, was only, there were limits to how, how much he could hit me. But thank you, sir, for taking the time to come. Certainly, Ambassador Kamal. Until we meet again next week and we'll be discussing economics and my panelist will be the ambassador of, uh, of, uh, of? of Peru. So until we meet again, goodbye.